good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, not for anything, but uh, it's it's April 18th, I believe. And uh, let me check that. Hold on a second. Yeah, it's April 18, 2020. And this morning, uh, we're going to do world history for ordinary people. <clears throat> Uh, and this will be the 10th in the series, and of course, I'm Joe Weinberg, and this is Bluebird Semaphore. Uh, I keep coming back to these world history videos because, and, and creating them, because it, it is extremely interesting. Even though the libraries are still closed, I cannot go to the library and read what I want to read, but uh, still... Uh, I'm, I'm leaning heavily on two books, and I believe I've mentioned them. One, uh, Fatal Discord. I think that's the title. It's uh, it's about uh, Erasmus and Luther, and and their uh, their con confliction and their confrontation. Although rarely face to face, as far as I see in this book so far. But you know, they were at odds <clears throat> philosophically, theologically, what have you. But uh, that book and the other one, <clears throat> God's bestseller, the one on T William Tins Tisdale, Tinsdale, whatever you pronounce it, and uh, with Thomas More playing a secondary role in, in that book. But, uh, and, and without going to the Bible and opening up this discord on the Reformation, you know, I'm constantly coming to the conclusion that well, I know exactly where this is going and it's starting to become a little repetitious and and um, you know I want to get on with it so the reason why it's becoming repetition and, and so on and so forth is because we know the end results even before we start the end results of the Reformation is that <clears throat> whereas the, there was one large Christian sect before the Re Reformation, that is, the Catholic sect. When it was over, there was two large ones, the Catholic and the Protestants. And you know, from external, externally, they look the same. They have buildings, they have priests, they have parishioners, they have doctrine, and so on, and they look very much the same. But, you know, it, when you peer into them, yes, there are differences. But... I, for one, would say that the, the differences are not <clears throat> even that important. They don't get to the heart of the matter. They, they skirt it, as always. Uh, these all institutions, whether they're religious, or secular, or whatever, the... the the heart of the matter always gets skirted. And institutions regroup and they reappear almost identical, identically as they were before the push for change came about. Anyway, that's not what history is about. History is about trying to understand the chain, the links. And who were the uh, important figures in in this 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 history and that history? So I'm starting to get closer to something that you know from the beginning I needed to get closer to was was essentially how did Erasmus become Erasmus? And and bits and pieces pop up all over the place, and it seems clear eventually that he he gets. At a very early age, while he's still in school, he gets his vision of what the religious religion and 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 uh, faith theology should be about. Basically, it should be about goodness and and kindness and charity. He, he really believes in that, and he gets that from a certain line of pre. Erasmus theologians that you can trace right to the school where he got his his uh, tutoring, so to speak, uh, in, in these matters. 
and and it goes back at least back to a fellow named Garrett, and I think that's the first name, Groot, and there's another guy before him, actually, and I'm forgetting it now, but Groot was instrumental in putting together a, a theological philosophy, and, and it was primarily about being living in a very fairly spiritual monastic uh, type of life, although I do believe that they didn't feel that that sort of monastic life had to be in a monastery. You could live in your town and, and come together as groups and, and still have that monastic spirit that you would, you would be somewhat... <clears throat> low key in your demeanor in your in your test or in your life you would live a simple life and you would be filling your thoughts and your mind with the scripture and and the good works etc to help people charity and so on so this guy Groot uh, he gets moving something called the Brethren of, i got to go back to my note here, the Brethren, da, 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 Brethren, Brethren of, uh, Brethren of the Common Life, and he was also, I think he, he was a early, early, early brilliant, student, and um, so he did his writings, Devotion, Devotion Modern, or something like that, what is it, Devotional Modern, yeah. anyway, he wrote a devotional, he did it. many things, but the, the scholarly part of this young man, because he, he, he died in his early 40s, yes, by the plague, and um, I mean, he's so smart. He, he goes to study in Paris, the Sorbonne, and uh, other great uh, institutes of learning. He was uh, he was quite the scholarly type, and <clears throat> he he puts this uh, concept in play in the very uh, church, very monastery that Erasmus gets sent to Devon something in in the Lowlands, uh, and so. The line is clear that that's where Erasmus picked up his stuff from this guy Groot, whose his dates are in the 1300s. So uh, approximately at least 100 years or so before Erasmus is hitting, hitting the pavement. But, but uh, and very influential. He, this guy was Groot, was extremely inf instrumental in this starting to want to move away from the uh, improprieties of the Catholic Church. And, and there were many of them. I mean, these people were making money hands over fist at, at the expense of the people. There's no doubt about it. No doubt about it. And, and so uh, that's where Erasmus gets his, his, his inclinations. Now, <clears throat> interestingly enough, uh, from my understanding is that Luther also appreciated this guy, and he was he was taking fondly to his works, just as Erasmus was. But Erasmus goes in this direction from it, and Luther goes in another direction. A, uh, you know, it starts like this, and actually it has to go through yet another uh, pivotal person, Thomas Akempis. Uh, and and his his works and uh, of course Thomas Akempis, those who have studied some religious history uh, are familiar with the the book of his the Imitation of Christ and that is heralded as the second most popular book after the Bible. Period. End of story. And it's a devotional that you had to live. And so 
Erasmus and Luther both picked up on it, and they they were fond of it, but they went in different directions. Now, <clears throat> with uh, Kempis's book, uh, he. This book was, was carried about by world leaders throughout history. They, they, they wanted it at their side, you know? Kings, electors, generals, they all wanted this. It was so great. Now, I haven't really read it that much. I think years ago, 40 years ago, I may have flipped a few pages. But, uh, and I guess I got to get back to that. I got to get back to that. I got to get back to Groot. That's that's going to be where I'll be able to understand the uh, philosophies and theologies of the Reformation, I believe. <clears throat> but Aquinas, Aquinas, that's another one. You you got to go before group and study Thomas Aquinas because he's starting to you shake up the pot already. And uh, so the. Thomas, his book leads to uh, the the activities that will come about because of Erasmus and Luther. Uh, in all of this, now we, we're also, and, and we're when we're talking Erasmus and Luther, we're talking early fifteen hundreds, pretty much. That was their period of activity. And most of us, like some of us, have heard of the imitation of Christ. Many of us have heard uh, that Martin Luther tacked his 95 theses on the church door <clears throat> in Wittenberg. And the story behind that is he, he, was fine. he was getting really fed up with these indulgence things. Now, the indulgence thing goes way back. No, not way back. It goes back to the 1300s. It was, it was a priest. I forget his name. I don't really think it's important. But there was a priest, and he came up with the idea. He was probably sitting around. Maybe he didn't have much to do. And he dreamed up this idea. He says, you know what? All these saints and, and the Blessed Virgin, they have stored up so much merit. There's they, this immense, almost infinite amount of merit. And it's just sitting there. It's not being used. So why don't we think of something we could do with it? Bing! The light bulb went off in his head. He says, we could sell that merit to people who aren't saints, who are worried about their sentences, their time, that they're going to have to spend in purgatory with the flames looking at their feet. Terrible, terrible thing to think of. So they decide they're going to do it, and uh, they come up with ways of doing it. And... <clears throat> Primarily, they come up with a type of person that's known as an indulgence salesman. And they go around the country selling indulgences. And basically, indulgences are a piece of paper that the salesman signs on. And, uh, you know, as, the, as an authority of this or that high ecclesiastic type probably the Pope in most cases, and you can get so much indulgence. And basically they're using that bank that stored up merit of all the saints that's just sitting there going to waste. So now they'll use some of that to alleviate the pain and suffering of the poor souls in purgatory, and they'll make money. And the church will have its coffers filled up once again. And that went on for uh, 300 years or so, and uh, not 300, 200 years, and, and it's 50, year 1517. And what goes on at this time in, in the world, some of the big shots, like Elector Frederick of Saxony, he had something upward of 20,000 relics. And on, on uh, November 1st, which is like All Saints Day, he would have them on view for people to come by. And when, you know, if they throw in arms for this relic, they would get so much indulgence and they would get the paper written out right there. So it's a great way of making money. Now, the reason why I bring up 1517 
because in that year there's a big play going on in Wittenberg. And uh, <clears throat> to, to show you what type of person Martin Luther was, when they, he was told, hey, you better get out of here, you know, we're all going to die. He says, no, my place is here. So he stays in Wittenberg. And uh, <coughs> the, uh, the pilgrims who are coming for these uh, indulgences, they come in hordes anyway. Plague or no plague, they are going to get their indulgences. So that happens. But in this time frame, this is, and this, this was going to be, in, in this time frame, they, it came about an indulgence called the St. Peter's Indulgence. <coughs> And if you <coughs> did whatever it took to get that, probably a certain amount of money, you would get the, this plenary indulgence. You would never, ever have to worry about the sins of the past, sins of the future. You were in excellent shape. So, and the money was going to be used to help build, continue to build St. Peter's Church in Rome. Now, how did we get the St. Peter's indulgence? Well, uh, I guess it was Leo the Tenth was uh, in, in. He was in financial straits. He was a big spender, but uh, he turns to the wealthiest family in Europe, and I think that the name is the Foggers or the Froggers or something like that. It's something with an F and Augers, the Foggers. Anyway, he turns to them. They think about it. They says, "Well, here's what you do." You sell an indulgence, a special indulgence, blah, blah, blah. St. Peter's, half of it will go to the, the indulgence seller, salesman. Some of it will go to the local municipalities and dioceses. And the rest will go to Rome, where some of that will wind up building uh, St. Peter's. And a few of it, Leo, you can put in your pocket. Don't worry about it. So... That's how that came about, all in this time frame, 1517. And, but to be fair, you don't want to go knocking these indulgences completely. To be fair, a great deal of that money collected by indulgences went to build not only St. Peter's, not only to, to uh, keep up the abbeys and the monasteries and the priests and this and that and the monks, it built bridges, it built hospitals, it built monasteries, it built schools. It was like the, the taxation system that we have in the modern world. It, it did public goods, public good works, you know, streets, everything. So it did, you know, it's half of one, six of one, half a dozen of another. It did some good, it was also a little bit of Thievery. And what really irked the German people and the people north of the Alps was that their money was being drained by these indulgence uh, sales and going down to the, the south of the Alps. In other words, it was going to Rome. <clears throat> and that annoyed them. Just like today, we were annoyed when tariffs are <clears throat> uh, discriminated against us. So... It's the same thing, just different talk, different words, different ideas, but it's all the same thing. <coughs> Money drain going from here to going there. And people, you know, accusing flat out that this is terrible, 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 yet there's certainly a, uh, a saving, saving grace here. There is a... Uh, uh, socially redeemable, whatever you want to call it, uh, part of this indulgence, which, like I said, was was doing public good works that were needed. So uh, there we have the thing on indulgence. There we have the thing on Thomas Akempis. There we have the stuff on Garrett Group. And I'm convinced that if I go back and study from the uh, pre group people involved in this line to the Reformation, I'm going to get the real story. Um, you know, the, the, the story of, on the other side being the, the Lutheran side is always the same old thing. He's, a, he's, a, he's just a discontented person 
who's bright enough to beat all his opponents. And he's he's not going to give up. He's just going to keep going and going and going until he gets his way. And that's an old familiar story. And I, I don't find a great deal to... Uh, to, uh, to to garnish from that, you know, it's it's the same old stuff. I mean, even if you read the ninety five theses, mostly it's just eight concepts over and over and over. It's like what they say about Vivaldi, you know, Vivaldi, Antonio Vivaldi, great uh, composer of I want to call it the eighteenth century, maybe the late seventeen, early eighteenth century. I'll say early eighteenth century. Vivaldi. They say Vivaldi wrote the same concerto 600 times. Because when you hear his concertos, they sound very similar. They sound very similar. They're beautiful. I mean, he was a great, he is, was a great composer. And from early on listening to classical music, yours truly, you've been listening to it for 50 years. Uh, those four seasons of Vivaldi, I mean, they're just so spectacular that in Truly being earnest, I couldn't have been more earnest. I would tell people that this music was divine. This stuff came from the unknown aspects of the world, the divine aspects. And somehow Vivaldi had a hook into that, and he did his Four Seasons. And quite frankly, they have not diminished one bit in my uh, interpretation of that music. Now, there's a lot of great classical music, and it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Matter of fact, yesterday I heard a 94, 98, old pianist uh, playing in the Academy of Music in Philadelphia, uh, Chopin and Mozart, and uh, it's just the, the Chopin stuff. Now, technically, you could see the, the 94, 98-year-old guy was a little bit hampered, not much, but the beauty and the approach to playing that Chopin piece, it's just so gorgeous, you can't describe it. You cannot describe it. By the way, I think the name of the fellow is Menachem Brez Pressler. 94, 95, he was in Germany with the Nazis, he had a flea. All his grandparents, uncles and aunts were exterminated in the gas chambers. Somehow he got out, and uh, he, he lived. He did. He lived in Israel for a time, and then I think he, he maybe he migrated to the United States. I'm not sure, but uh, a wonderful man, a great career. As a matter of fact, he, his, and I'm quoting off of W, WRTI, who had to rebroadcast of that of that uh, concert, and uh, it was uh, like the 70th anniversary of of uh, Menachem Pressler's uh, first appearance with the Academy of Music 70 years ago, and of course Eugene Ormandy was uh, conducting the orchestra at the time. So that's that's way off the beaten path. I thought there was going to be <coughs> tie-in with Poland here, but he was he was not Polish. He was German. Uh, so anyway, to get back to what I was saying is that uh, I do believe that the continued study of uh, of the the line from going back to Saint Thomas Aquinas. And then through this group person and the brotherhood of this and that, common brotherhoods of common life, or whatever they're called, and on leading to the school that was run by the Augustine, Augustinian, Augustine uh, community, where Erasmus got some early, early education, <clears throat> it's going to be quite fruitful. But on the other hand, with the Luther, to me, it seems it's the same old thing. And after a while, that gets, you know, it just gets tiring, you know. Yeah, we know you're upset. Okay, you don't like this. You know, okay, we know it. Now, what are you going to do about it? You know, so. Uh, he, 
he tacked up his 95 theses, which you read them. It's the same old thing over and over and over. He just keeps saying it in a slightly different way. You know? But uh, I don't mean to demean the guy, but quite frankly, he, he would have... Uh, Early, early childhood intervention would have helped that guy, I think, a great deal. And um, as, as early childhood intervention would have helped many people back in the 16th century and the 15th century, uh, you know, we just, we have the, uh, the advantage of having looked at how people live in a more scientific way fashion and, and and what motivates people in a more scientific fashion and then if we find people in need of special attention we do that now we give them special attention we, hopefully we work out their uh, problems and they move along and not just beating up the uh, the society because they don't like it you know I mean, there's always reform throughout history, always. And the reform that works well is the gradual, uh, well thought out movement forward, movement towards progress. That has worked well. I think the, the reformation that split off from Catholicism was much too dramatic a split. It was somewhat like throwing the baby out with the bath water. So, uh, on the other hand, you know, I'll have my opinions on why it worked. It worked because that movement towards Luther was was more kindly towards uh, people who were getting beat up financially. The, the, the middle class, the new class of people who had small businesses and so on. So I think that that helped that being like that because they could get the, 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 the ecclesiastics off their back and the great amount of garnishing of their money that was <clears throat> part of the way Rome operated at the time. So that could be very, very key in why that works so well. The uh, going in the other direction with the, with the keeping of the Catholic tradition, there's a lot of, of uh, glory in the artistic tradition of the Catholic church and there's a great deal, I believe, of uh, personal relief in knowing you can offload your burden of sin and grief and, and worryment and fear to this institution called the Catholic Church. On the other hand, you know, they always want you to do it on the other side of the fence. They always want you to do it for yourself. <clears throat> it's like the... I don't even mention it, but you know, you do it for yourself, but you know, give us your money. <laughs> it's, there's a lot of things that are like that in the world, not just uh, religious organizations. But you know, we're forgetting somebody here. We're forgetting William Dale and uh, his buddy Thomas More, which uh, to me, that's the second interesting story here. The first one is Erasmus, the second is William Dale. And I think he's interesting because he, he's, a, he's a renegade, no doubt about it. He's a elusive renegade. And um, I think I said it before, but that title page to his uh, New Testament, the English version, is just something that, that's uh, immensely beautiful and, and should be seen by everybody. So we got more to do. I hope the library is open up soon. Let this, uh, this goes away. And uh, there's certain other things I wanted to talk about, but they're not, not really Reformation-centric, so I really shouldn't. But I think I will just mention that for my entire life, I always thought, 
what a crazy topic to introduce, except that the plague and that's going on. The uh, leprosy, which really isn't a plague, but it's a very bad disease. And I always thought that that had to be somehow tropical. And when I would read that Jesus uh, cured the leper, I would say, what was a leper doing in, in the middle of the Holy Land? You know, and I've thought about, well, he could have been walking in from India. The people did a lot of big time journeys like that <coughs> back then. It could have been all of that. Plus, with the leprosy, one of my heroes from way back is uh, Brother Damien, who at a very early age, I, I, I think he was maybe 19, he's in a, some sort of religious order, and he volunteers to go help the, uh, the lepers in, in Hawaii. Just the, the missionaries are coming back with tales of that. So he goes there and he, you know, he does, uh, he sacrifices his life for these people. So I, he's always one of my heroes, still is one of my heroes. And yes, I want to go back and read more, read him all over again. <clears throat> but the reason why I'm bringing this up, because for some reason, in one of the books I was reading, and I think it's the one, Fatal Dis Discord, the, the author thought it necessary to mention what the priest had to do as far as the lepers were concerned, they had a, the priests were were the ones, and we're talking probably the much lower level priest. They had to instruct these lepers that they had to be quarantined themselves. Oh, there's a word we're hearing a lot today: quarantine. They had to quarantine themselves. They had to wear material around their faces and cover their bodies. And the quarantine, in many cases, was a a little a walled community outside the town or the city walls, where that was where they could live. And the priests had, uh, once again, the lower level priests were the ones responsible for instructing <coughs> these lepers how to do. And I, I, I only think the reason that that was introduced was the uh, to try to give a feeling that uh, these these religious types weren't all bad. They they did do works of mercy and so on. So and I and I once again I brought that in even though I think it's an aside is that uh, my true uh, very very impressed with Brother Damien and uh, I continue to be impressed with him. I can't I can't remember if they made him a saint or not. But uh, if they didn't, they certainly should have. So can I wrap this up? Could somebody tell me to please be quiet? <laughs> okay, listen. Thanks for li listening. This would have been World History for Ordinary People 10. And I hope shortly the libraries will be open and I can go get newer material, maybe more interesting material, and so on and so forth. You know, I'm using the web to get some stuff now, and it's proving to be fairly effective. But you have to be tenacious. You know, you really got to go through a bunch of garbage until you get something of value. Uh, this is on the web. And keep in mind, the web back in the 60s was created so that scholars from the University of Southern California and from Carnegie Mellon Institute and the University of Michigan, and so on, and Stanford could have a little network to discuss some projects they were working on. It wasn't this fluff and garbage that you get on the internet today, and not to talk about all the criminal aspects of the internet, and uh, why people choose to go down that route is is just beyond me. Now, there I go. I'm going down that route. I am. And I apologize. I ask for your forgiveness. Try to keep a, a, a good thought about why, even though I defame the Internet as a horror, I'm using it myself. It's, uh, it's very, uh, it's, it's hard to figure out and why we humans do these things. We say something is wrong on one hand and we go and we do these, uh, we go and do it anyway. So uh, I could just go on talking and talking and talking about 
some of the things these uh, these Reformation people come up with. But one of the things they come up with, and I think it's mostly down the uh, Erasmus uh, road, and, and Luther could have been on this also, was that there's no such thing as a just war. No such thing. So with that thought, I'll leave you. Remember, peace, silence, wilderness. <laughs>